Just because a person is not totally mentally healthy, it does not make them mentally ill. We have to learn how to start reframing and taking back power over how we see words and the meaning that we have for words. Welcome to the Zami Nobla National Organization of Black Lesbians on Aging podcast. We are your sound source for Black lesbian history. I'm your host, Angela Denise Davis. My name is Dion Bates, or Dr. Dion Bates. Uh, I'm an Atlanta area therapist, and I, the first time I lived in Atlanta, I was here about 18 years. And I left in 2010 to go take a position at Georgia Southern University, where I was for five years. And then I came back to Atlanta, um, kind of living in between Statesboro and Atlanta Mm -hmm. um, in 2015. And then in 2016, started making the transition back to Atlanta, Um, was doing private practice in both places, but realized that the clientele that I had here in Atlanta was growing Uh, significantly faster than I anticipated. I have a practice up in Marietta, Georgia. It's called Self Solstice LLC. Thank you so very much for inviting me on today. It is our pleasure. Our goal today is to have a conversation around mental health at the intersection of race, gender, and sexual identity. Because we recognize that there are some things very particular about being a Black lesbian, the way in which we move in the world. And when you add different layers onto that, like age, like ability, Mm -hmm. let's start by talking about the way in which there is a great deal of stigma in the African-American community around mental health. Mm -hmm. There is a great deal of stigma, um, I think, in part because myself growing up in the South and and, and, in a Southern Black family, you, to be an adult now and to look back you knew that there were individuals who were dealing with some mental health conditions, but you never heard anyone say that. It was always, this person has bad nerves, or, you know, this person is crazy, or, you know, and and things like that. And I think that, particularly as African Americans within the community, there's that stigma there that if you have some sort of mental health condition, that you're looked upon as being crazy, or that you're ostracized even by your own families and certainly by your community. One of the things that we have to try to do within our community, number one, is take take back ownership of our community, mm-hmm. but also um, in taking back that ownership, um, reframing the whole idea of mental health. I think that there's a huge difference between how we focus on mental illness versus mental health. We all have mental health. We all have physical health. You know, mental health is health too. And just as someone who might have high blood pressure or diabetes, there are certain things that they may have to do in order to be able to manage those conditions while still being able to live a healthy lifestyle. Mm -hmm. The same thing is true for individuals who have mental health conditions. Um, And to some degree, you know, we, we all have mental health conditions. We all have mental health, Mm -hmm. you know, but there may be certain things that some of us have to do differently than others in an effort to manage that mental health so that we can function at our optimal best. So let's take a step back. You talked about owning our community. What do you mean by that? So when I say owning our community in the context of mental health, one of the things that is necessary for us to do is to, instead of you know, ostracizing people within our community who have either been diagnosed or who have undiagnosed uh, mental health conditions. I think the one thing that we have to do is, again, stop buying into the stigma of mental illness and start investing in our mental health. A part of that is when we have individuals, particularly those in our families, we have to be able to reframe things in a way that is one more healthy obviously if you're talking about mental health in talking about that that is a a much healthier way than talking about mental illness i think sometimes when we talk about illness it 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 tends to keep people sick mm-hmm. 
And so rather than talking about mental health conditions in the way of uh, mental illness, taking back our communities by reframing some of the conditions that we see within our communities so that we're looking at people in a healthier way Mm -hmm. and helping them to view themselves in a healthier way. You know, we're talking about, again, mental health at the intersection of race, gender, and sexual identity. Mm -hmm. Uh, We can even throw in age since we are looking at a targeted population of black lesbians 40 and over. Sure. Um, And you talked about how we're situated in the South. Mm Mm-hmm. So we can't really talk about African-American communities, in my estimation, without also talking about black churches. Mm. I think it's so easy for us to see how churches may have a campaign against diabetes and high blood pressure and getting these things checked. Mm -hmm. But we're not so willing to talk about this uh, mental health piece in that same way. And then when you put the layer of sexual identity on top of that, where so many people uh, who are even LGBT will attend a church that's homophobic and find themselves sitting in that congregation Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, Mm -hmm. uh, then it seems like there's a whole nother dimension of religion that we have to talk about in our communities in order for us to be well. And as they would say, clothed and in our right minds. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I definitely would agree with you with regards to that. Um, I was talking to a minister maybe about a month ago, and we were actually talking about the same thing, um, the the church and mental health. And I think that for a lot of black folk, particularly those, and and I keep going back to the South because that's kind of where I was raised, Mm -hmm. Um, And that's kind of been my frame of reference. But I think particularly for a lot of black folks um, in the South, the church has been a cornerstone for many of us. And the church has been there when we were not allowed in any other community. Mm -hmm. And so as a result of that, I think that in, in being in church and, 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 and wanting to be there and wanting to feel a part of that community, um, when we could not feel community anywhere else, um, it, it, it becomes a matter of survival. Mm-hmm. And granted, being in church is a part of it, but it's kind of like no one person can be all things to all people. Mm-hmm. No one place can serve a purpose for all people because we are not one dimensional beings. Mm-hmm. We have many different dimensions that make up who we are in totality. And so as much as the church has been a saving grace, if you will, for a lot of black people, a lot of black gays and lesbians, it's also been a place of tremendous turmoil based upon interpretations of biblical scriptures. And and again, you know, in some ways, just kind of, you know, that that sexuality part being invisible you know, it's kind of, OK, yeah, we will accept you, but just don't say nothing about it. Mm-hmm. Or, um, you know, if you could just hide this part of you, then we'll be OK. Mm-hmm. Um, but then when you add scripture to it, um, it, it really can cause a lot of harm and cause a lot of trauma. Um, and, 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 you know, and we talk about church hurt and things like that. Mm-hmm. But you also have to remember that a lot of black lesbians and, and, and gays have been traumatized Mm -hmm. to go into an environment that is on the one hand accepting kind of sorta Mm -hmm. only to be traumatized by the kind of sorta acceptance. Mm -hmm. As an ordained minister, I am very much interested and invested in um, black lesbians having places of worship, uh, spiritual Mm -hmm. communities that are healthy. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I know sometimes religion can be just as much of a hindrance as it can be a help. And so it's it's very important that I see and uh, can participate in places where we can have both our spirits and our minds in a very healthy place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, So when I hear about individuals who are in some of these toxic situations, be it a church, Mm -hmm. be it a social group, uh, or be it any other place where they are continually 
hearing uh, negative messages about who they are. Right. Uh, I almost want to say, get out, right. you know, run. Right. This is not healthy, be it a family, be right. it a church. And and, and, and and sometimes not even just about um, the their, their sexual orientation or their sexual identity, but even in terms of their gender identity. This is why I'm so excited about queer theologians and queer ministers and women in ministry who are conscious about the ways in which text has been read and interpreted. Yeah, and, and, and I like how you're using the word interpretation. Um, I, 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 I think that kind of like what you said before and having these um, spaces where people come to worship and, and being able to offer a different interpretation of scripture for people. But I think also more importantly, being able to offer an open forum for people to understand that, you know, in this interpretation, in the meaning of these words, as it applies to the meaning of your life, Mm -hmm. you have the power to be able to define whatever that meaning is for you. Mm -hmm. And I, and I sometimes feel like that may be the piece from, you know, a lot of congregations that might be missing. It's like this, this is the word and, and this is the way that it should be. But when you think about the way that we live, you know, words have meaning. Mm-hmm. And to different people, those words have different meanings. Mm-hmm. In order for people to be healthy, number one, they have to be able to take some time to really reflect on what certain things mean to them. You know, and and in being in other spaces with individuals where, for instance, whether it's church and, and scripture is being interpreted, you know, what do what what does that mean to you in the context of the meaning you have defined for your for yourself? Church, community, and social organizations, family, finding places that support our mental health mm-hmm. uh, in light of the way in which we show up as older black lesbians. I I also want to talk about how family can be a place where we can encounter things that either affirm us or things that challenge us, particularly as there are some older black lesbians who are now called to be caregivers for parents. Mm -hmm. And there may have been some uh, places of estrangement or some real toxic relationships. And now they're having to come into this position of giving care to a parent. And there's some, some very difficult uh, relational dynamics there. Yeah, that can be a very, very tough place to be in, um, particularly for many of us who are caretaking for our mothers. You know, for most of us, and again, I I keep referencing the South because Mm -hmm. that's where my parents are from, and my mother is a true Southern belle. You look in the dictionary under Southern belle and you see her face. And I always... As a child, I would always look at my mother and I would watch her get dressed and she would put on her makeup and she would, and she would, you know, get her clothes all nicely ironed and everything. And, and I used to say, you know what, Ma, you are so pretty. And to me, even today, she is still the epitome of femininity to mm-hmm. me. But also, my mother was raised in the South in a Southern rural church, you know, so the idea of me being a lesbian was probably the furthest thing from her mind. And she struggled with it in part because of, you know, religious scripture. And, um, and for a while, you know, it was, it was certainly an issue between us. But the one thing that I I really give my mother credit for is that I think that she tried, really tried the best that she could to come to a place where she could not only uh, not only understand but try to be as affirming as she could be and sometimes you know it ebbed and flowed mm-hmm. you know with mm-hmm. with the affirmation before our conversation today we referenced an article that we both read from the Huffington Post about um a woman who in her 40s uh came out to her mother mm-hmm. and and the takeaway for me from that um article was her understanding that she loved her mother, but also the realization that she no longer had an opportunity to have an intimate relationship with her mother because her mother was uh, homophobic and really not interested 
in her talking about that aspect of herself. For me, that was a real sense of self-care mm-hmm. and her coming to understand that in order for her to protect herself and to respect herself, mm-hmm. there had to be certain boundaries that she made around the relationship she had with her mother and probably with other people. As we talk about, you know, just being in places where we may um, encounter individuals who are not supportive or even toxic and hostile, how is it that people for their own mental health can create some of those boundaries that are protective um, and at the same time recognize that you can love someone, but uh, at the same time, the opportunity for intimacy isn't there? I think that... um one of the things that a lot of people struggle with is that this is my family. And despite how I feel in my family, this is my family. And I think a part of it is being able to see that even though this is your family and even though you love your family, there are other ways and there are are other places for you. Um, And again, I think with Zami Nobla, and and other agencies, you know, the the more presence that certain organizations like this has, the more that people who are within these kinds of situations can see that this is not the only thing out there for them. Um, I think a lot of times, you know, especially with clients who come into my office, they deal with whether it's a toxic family member, whether it's being in a in a toxic church, and they get to a point where they recognize that this is where I am and this may be all that they know. And I'm really, really trying hard to be okay in this place. And so sometimes coming into my office and we start talking about this and, and, and they realize, Oh, there are other resources out there um, is something that is very freeing, even though they haven't yet pursued those other resources, Mm -hmm. knowing that there are other resources, knowing that there are other options knowing that there are other choices for them, knowing that they have the power to make a different choice is very freeing for them, even if they are afraid to make that choice right at that point in time. And helping people to, you know, kind of go back through and take a look at who's in their support system. If there are not a lot of people in their support system, let's look at some ways in which we can expand that support system, Mm -hmm. you know, even for me, um, my mother at one point was not a person in my support system when it came to my sexual identity. But my aunt, my mother's oldest sister, who I used to live with in Ohio, you know, when I decided I was going to come, she was like, oh, yeah, baby, I already knew that. Yes. And <laughs> and she was like, and, and when I would go, I would live with her and then I would go back to visit. Yeah, I got such and such and such and such coming over. They're going to take you out. And, and they took me all around Dayton and all around Cincinnati to the LGBT places. And I was like, oh, OK. So, you know, really reexamining our support system to see who is the person that embraces me the most. Who is the person that I that I really feel comfortable talking to? And it doesn't necessarily mean that you are are ready to come out to that person, Mm -hmm. but just being able to have the love and nurturance of that person Mm -hmm. as you are working through these issues of coming out. And speaking about coming out, I think that's a a, it's a very important aspect of mental health for uh, our community. Most certainly. And there are some women I know that I speak to who are older women and they still have not been able to make that leap into their authentic selves and have community to support them Mm -hmm. around that. You know, we recognize that. And at the same time, a part of me feels kind of sad about that because I know that there's just so much freedom that I have now as someone who is out as opposed to when I was a much younger woman and I didn't have the capacity to work through that or right. at that time and I had to really work on it. Um, I recognize that I was not free. Mm-hmm. But now as an older woman and just the joys of, as we all know, when you are older, your voice is there, you know, your presence is there. You move around the world in a different way. Right. Um, what do we say to help someone who, let's say, is an older woman in 50s or 60s? She may not have had a, a sense of knowledge about who she was before this time. Uh, she may even be in a place where uh, she has to have a caregiving role with a parent 
and she really wants to come out. I mean, what are some ways in which we can talk about that and help people kind of massage that, that process coming out as an older woman? Mm. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, I think a couple of things. Thing number one, um, I have a love-hate relationship with technology, mm -hmm. but technology has become a wonderful way for people, especially people in whether it's a rural community or whether it's communities that tend to be very isolated, um, to get connected with larger communities. Um, so whether it's research, whether it's um, Facebook groups, whether it's, you know, finding out more about coming out, um, there, there is a lot of information that helps um, that someone could pull up, you know, online in terms of just kind of the, 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 the general principles of coming out and things of that nature. Of course, when we're dealing with African-American lesbians, particularly those who are not out, who are older, um, and as you said, who may be in a caregiving role, you know, I think that there are a lot of other dynamics there that also have to be um, considered. Number one, where is this person located? Number two, in terms of the caregiving, does this person have any assistance or is this person the sole caregiver of their parent or their brother or whomever they're caregiving for? Um, I think the other thing, and, and this goes along that a lot of times people don't really mention with regards to caregiving, is that as a caregiver, it is really, really critical that you make sure that you are taking care of yourself first. Mm -hmm. Even on the airplane, they tell you to put your mask on first before you help somebody else because mm -hmm. you go to helping somebody else and they get off the plane and you've passed out and you can't even put your mask on and everybody else on the plane is gone and you there without the mask. So as much as that concept to a lot of people, particularly black daughters who are caring for black mothers, mm -hmm. because there is this hierarchical relationship you have to make sure that you are taking care of you before you're taking care of someone else. Without you, there is no care for the other person. And for some of us, it's more so about giving ourselves permission to take care of ourselves. It might be a part of the self-care that we are giving to ourselves is taking the time to really think about what coming out will be for us, how coming out will be freeing for us. Mm -hmm. um, how coming out may be a saving grace for us. But also having the understanding that the way in which you come out is your process. You don't have to come out based upon what someone else says or based upon something that you read. Mm -hmm. It is a process that you get to take ownership and it can be as quickly or as slowly as you need it to be. Mm -hmm. And that's the other thing that I would say with regards to coming out. I never encourage anybody to try to encourage someone to come out mm -hmm. because at the end of the day, you can't, if you can't promise that you can replace for them what they might lose, then you really have no right to dictate to them what their coming out process should look like. However, when we're talking about people, particularly people who are older, you know, there's a lot at stake. And even though you may be living in isolation, sometimes that isolation feels a lot safer than freeing yourself because you, you because there's so much fear about, okay, well, well, if I, if I come out, am I going to lose this or, or what's going to happen here? Am I going to lose my family? Am I going to lose my job? If I lose my job, I don't know what's going to happen to my, um, my loved one or whatever the case may be. But I think that just encouraging them that you get to take power and ownership over you having power and ownership over you and the accountability over you means that you get to dictate that process for yourself and when you understand just how much control you have over yourself it can be extremely empowering and very healthy not only mentally but spiritually and physically as well what you just said was so powerful because I believe sometimes we do want to push people into the place of being out when they need to take that journey themselves. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I always tell people is my freedom makes it possible for me to speak in a way, in a volume 
mm-hmm. that uh, allow someone else to hear. And when they're ready, mm-hmm. when they want to speak, when they need to speak and find right. a place to do that in their own freedom, they can do that. And then someone else will hear their voice and it becomes this echo. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But people have to hear it on their own. I know women who are in the place where uh, they may be a part of the Zami Nobla Facebook group and they're quote unquote voyeurs, Mm -hmm. but it's the place for them to learn, to listen Mm -hmm. and to have some safety. They may Mm -hmm. not say anything right? uh, and they may not even be out, but it's a place where they can find support and Mm -hmm. community. Exactly. Exactly. You know, Again, you know, I have this love hate relationship with 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 technology and social media. Um, I always feel like social the social media part it always makes us so antisocial because we're now instead of calling people we do it on Facebook. Mm-hmm. But but that's one of the beauties about places like Facebook and Twitter and um, what Instagram or whatever you call Instagram. it. Instagram, yes. Um, it's one of the beauties because it really is a different type of community. Mm -hmm. So women who may not have access to, you know, a large city where they might be able to find a community, they have that community online. Um, Women who may not have access to, you know, some of the um, conferences or some of the activities that, that go on in larger cities, they're able to have that access online. And now that you can do Facebook Live and you can see all of these different things. So 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 you're right. In that sense, Facebook and and social media has become a a sense of community for lesbians of color um, who don't have access, you know, to the in, in, in the vicinity that in in a way is freeing for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. You know, when I think back to when I first started, you know, thinking about my own sexuality, you know, what was freeing for me was, you know, going to the library. Um, I know that, you know, Selma, Alabama is is, is where I come from. Mm -hmm. And so there was not a whole lot of conversation about gays and lesbians. But I will never forget being in college and taking um, literature, and I read this poem by Adrian Rich. I was like, oh my God, I got it now, you know? Yes. And then from that standpoint, it was like, okay, well, let me go to the library and, and try to find any book that I can find. Or, you know, at that time, it was um, VHS cassettes with mm-hmm. the VCR. Do yes. we even still have VCRs? But anyway, I would, so I would, yes. I would go to the uh, video store and see and see if I could find any mm-hmm. kind of movie or anything about, mm-hmm. you know, lesbians because I was trying to, like, I knew that there was something different about me, but I couldn't quite put my finger on it mm-hmm. because no one ever spoke it. So I, I didn't have that frame of reference. Mm-hmm. So, you know, but so I was out trying to get information and I was out trying to get, you know, just trying to get an understanding. And so I was able to go to the library. I was able to go to the video store and I was able to do these kinds of things until I was, um, and it must have been probably my, it had to have been my senior year in college. There used to be an organization in Atlanta called the African American Gay and Lesbian Alliance. I might have said it wrong, but it was ALGA. Mm -hmm. And they came to Montgomery, Alabama to do a retreat. And even at that time, I was not identifying as a lesbian or gay or anything. But I remember that for the first time, I felt so comfortable with people. And it was like, oh, my God, I feel so comfortable with these people but I'm not one of them. Oh, but maybe I am one of them. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing is that all of them, and they were much older than me, but all of them just welcomed me and embraced me and gave me exactly what I needed in an effort to be able to feel more free and giving myself permission to say, okay, let me explore a little bit more about this, what it is I'm saying that I'm not, but maybe I really am, you know. It was that organization, those people who came for that retreat, who 
open up an environment that allowed me to feel comfortable just being, regardless of how I identified, they offered an environment to allow me to just be. And in just being, I eventually evolved to being able to feel comfortable enough, not only identifying myself as a lesbian, but being able to articulate that to other people. Mm-hmm. I am forever grateful for for that night. I'll never forget it. They came to um, Montgomery, Alabama for their retreat. And at the time in Montgomery, Alabama, there was only one gay club and it was called Ho John's. <laughs> and we went and, and took them that night and we just had a really great time. Some people may find it hard getting to the place of walking to that therapist office. Mm-hmm. How can they, they best do that? Well, again, you know, the, the whole idea... I. I you're only responsible for your happiness. It it goes back to you have to take care of you before you can take care of someone else. If you're not happy, guess what? The other people around you are not going to be happy because you're not going to be happy. Mm -hmm. If you're miserable, you're going to probably either you're going to make everyone else miserable or when you're around everyone else, you're going to be miserable and you're going to still make everybody else miserable. So you really have to do the work and take care of yourself. And so I know for a lot of people, particularly for people of color, particularly for, 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 for black folks, you know, there's a huge stigma about going to see a therapist because your church tells us we're supposed to work everything out in church. We're supposed mm-hmm. to take it to the Lord in prayer. Mm-hmm. We take it to our Jesus closets, mm-hmm. you know, or go to the pastor and, 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 and understand there is nothing wrong with talking to your pastor. There is nothing wrong with prayer. I believe in prayer, Mm -hmm. but no one person can be all things to all people. Your pastor cannot be all things to you. And prayer without works, take it to the Lord in prayer, but you also have to do your work. And so if you're taking it to the Lord in prayer and God is telling you, hey, look, I put some people on this earth and everybody has different gifts and different talents. There are some of us who have been called to minister. There are some of us who have been called to do medicine. There are some of us who have been called to teach. Then certainly there are some people that God put on this earth to go to school and have the skills it takes to do mental health care. You can take it to the Lord in prayer, but you also have to go see someone who teaches you how to do your work. Your work is your responsibility. And it's very difficult for some people to walk into a therapist's office, in part because, you know, change is difficult for most of us. And I can tell you, I'm a creature of habit. Yes. You know, I I need structure. But Mm -hmm. I also recognize that sometimes the habits that we form are not necessarily habits that are beneficial for us. Sometimes we form habits and they may have been beneficial for us at that time. But as we continue to evolve, as we continue to grow, we have to go back and reassess whether or not those habits or those behaviors or the or even the way that we think are still working for us. Because sometimes we make decisions and we do things in survival mode. And once we get to a point where we no longer have to be in survival mode and we actually have the time to put more nurturance into ourselves, then, you know, some of that stuff that we that we did before, we see that it's not working for us. That's because, you know what, you've gotten a little bit further. Now it's time for you to do the work. You don't have to survive anymore. Now it's time to actually get in and do the work so that you can start nurturing yourself, nurturing your spirit, nurturing your mental health. I love that. But how do we help people who are not so gung-ho about therapy, but we know there need to be some um, consultation for their mental health? Sure. Um, I think that in a case like that, you continue to demonstrate to her that you are concerned. You, number one, and this is something that, Sometimes I even ask my own clients, particularly those who are very resistant to change. Mm -hmm. um, I'll ask, how can I support you? We've talked about this. We've talked about this. We've talked about this. It seems like you're in a space where you're not really ready to pursue those options. So in what ways can I support you? 
sometimes it's just a matter of asking them, how can I support you? Because, you know, we OK, I'll do this. I'll do that. And then everything we say we're going to do, either they don't want it done or they have a problem with the way that it's done, which is OK, as opposed to us stopping and just saying, well, you know what? Have you thought about how I can be supportive of you? Because that does two things. Thing number one is that it takes the pressure off of you from trying to figure out their problem. And thing number two, it puts them in a space and it sets up the mentality, oh, what do I need? And and it creates a level of responsibility for them to start thinking about what their needs are. And that's not to say that they will always know that they need this, 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 and this. But it, they may say, you know what, I don't know. And then you might say, well, have you thought about this? Or have you thought about this? And you start giving them things to think about so that, you know, when they're by themselves, they can start reflecting, okay, well, maybe I do need this. And you, you know what? You think about it and you let me know. Because then you, 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 you again, give them back responsibility for themselves. Mm-hmm. I am a huge believer in responsibility and accountability. Um, I always encourage people, you know, if you feel like someone needs some counseling, ask them if they would be willing to go speak with a therapist and let them know that you would be willing to go with them. But I would not push them because what I found is that when people come in to do therapy and someone else has pushed them, they're not yet ready to be there. Sometimes I have individuals who are ready to be in the room, but they may not really be ready to do the work. And that's okay. The fact that they are ready to be in the room is progress for them. And so for them, my role may just be to be just to sit with them where they are because you're ready to be here in the room. But sometimes I have individuals who who have felt pressured to be in the room and they're not ready to be in the room. And so we have to be respectful of that. We have to be respectful of where people are while at the same time letting them know that I am here to support you in whatever way I can. As you were talking, it made me think about drawing an analogy between the end of a church service when the doors of the church are thrown open Mm -hmm. and the person who walks down the front because they know that's where they need to go as opposed to taking someone's hand and dragging them mm-hmm. to the altar. Mm-hmm. And there's a real difference between the there's two. There's a huge <laughs> difference, a huge difference. Yeah. You know, there, there has to be a willingness. Mm-hmm. I have to have a willingness to do the things necessary with the tools that I'm given. Mm-hmm. And at the end of the day, some of us are at that space and some of us are not. And you can't, make anyone and you can't drag anyone you can but it typically doesn't really work out very well Mm -hmm. sometimes you can offer to just be able to sit in that space with them while still you know encouraging them maybe not now but maybe you know you would be willing to go and talk with someone i'll go with you it doesn't mean that you have to be committed to it it doesn't mean that you even have to stay and that's one of the things that i talk to new clients about you know when you come to see me, the first thing we're going to do, I'm going to ask you a lot of questions. It's not even going to really be a therapy session. That's because I want to start trying to get an understanding of what you see is going on with you. Mm-hmm. But also, this is an opportunity for you to sit with me. Ask me any questions you want to ask me. Bring up any concerns or, or, or raise any questions or, or comments and see if I'm someone you feel comfortable sitting with. If you don't feel comfortable sitting with me, you know what? My hope is that you will tell me. And if you tell me, I will say, you know what? Okay, let's see if we can get you connected with someone else. Because at the end of the day, my job is to try to get you the assistance that you need. So I think that, you know, by talking to that person and agreeing to maybe go with them and let them know that, you know, you can go and you can talk to this person. You can say as much or as little as you want to say. If you feel uncomfortable, you can get up and leave. No questions asked. That's important because one of the things that happens when they make the decision to get the help is that they learn that, okay, you're telling me that I have control over this. And a lot of times when people come into therapy and in a lot of the mental health conditions that that people are faced with, a lot of it really has to do with feeling as if you have 
no sense of control or very limited sense of control over who you are and the decisions that you make for yourself. Particularly when we're, particularly when we're talking about people who have been sometimes forced into caregiving roles, Mm -hmm. particularly when we're talking about people who feel like they're in communities who will not, uh, where they feel like they can't be who they are. Mm -hmm. They can't act in a way in which they feel is more innate for them. Mm -hmm. They can't identify in ways that they feel is more innate uh, for them. And so some of that is about helping them to look at, okay, let's look at what it is you do have control over. When you come into this office, you get to control just how long you stay here. You get to control on whether or not you come back. You get to control whether or not you say you want to come back. You get to control on how much, you, how little you say or how much you say. So these are things that I think that it's important for individuals, particularly older black lesbians, who may be open to the possibility of just consulting mm-hmm. with a counselor. The other thing is that, and this is something that I always say to my own clients, just because a person is not totally mentally healthy, it does not make them mentally ill. Mm -hmm. And this is where we come back to, we have to learn how to start reframing and taking back power over how we see words and the meaning that we have for words. So in other words, you know, let's not continue to buy into the stigma of mental illness Mm -hmm. and and let's start investing in our mental health. And sometimes that investment means going to see a therapist. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that investment means drawing boundaries where you say, you know what? No, I am going to do something for me today. I'll be back tomorrow to take care of this for you. But today I'm going to do this for me. Sometimes that means, you know, taking a drive outside of your community and, and, and going to the community that's, that's right next to yours, that may be a larger metropolitan city. And even though it might be anxiety provoking for you, but going to a get together or something you may have read about online, maybe Zami Nobla is, is, is doing some sort of event and you know, you're 15 minutes away. And so maybe, you know what, I'm going to get in my car and I'm going to go over here Mm -hmm. and see what this is all about. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're having a meet and greet. Maybe Mm -hmm. they're having, you know, whatever, but making the decision that, you know what, I am going to step outside of what is normal for me in an effort to try to create a new normal. Because at the end of the day, guess what? You can always go back to status quo. You can always go back. You know what it is to be right there. What would happen if you stepped outside of that just for a minute? Because you can always go back. There's a lot of freedom in knowing that. Yes. I suppose. Yes. And what I hear you saying, what that makes me think of is the power of just doing one thing Mm -hmm. and how that one thing can make a difference and the way in which you move after that decision. Yes. Sometimes it's just one thing, one decision to step out Mm -hmm. and to find community, to call a friend, Mm -hmm. to make a post on the Zami Nobla Mm -hmm. Facebook group to say, hey, I'm here. Is Mm -hmm. there anybody in my town? Just that one thing that can bring us back into a place of balance and good mental health Mm -hmm. and make it possible for us not to go in a different direction where we may have more stress and more anxiety and some depression. Just one thing. Right. You know, it's, and, and, and that's important. And I think the other piece too, um, and this, this goes back to the whole, um, idea of mental health. Again, we all have mental health. Everybody Mm -hmm. has mental, uh, mental health. We are all emotional beings. Mm -hmm. And I think the one thing that's really important for us is to learn how to be more aware of how we're feeling emotionally. Because when we can be aware of that, that can really be a lot of good information for us in terms of how we navigate our interactions with people. The other piece to that too is that even having mental health, there are times when all of us will feel depressed or sad or anxious or bored or discouraged because again we are all emotional beings Mm -hmm. to have those emotions doesn't make us sick it does not make us sick to have sometimes we feel sad and it's very appropriate Mm -hmm. 
Sometimes we feel anxious and it's very appropriate. Mm -hmm. Where we start getting into trouble is where we're feeling anxious more often than not. Mm -hmm. And it's interfering with our day-to-day -day activity or where we're feeling sad more often than not. And it's interfering with our day-to-day -day activity. That's where we start to kind of get in trouble. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to mental health, it's a matter of being aware of the emotions that we're experiencing and, and, and how those emotions are impacting the way that we navigate our day to day activity. There are days when we feel sad mm -hmm. and, and we feel like, you know, I'm really having a tough time today. Mm -hmm. And I think this is where the, the clarity needs to be made. Just because you're having a blue day doesn't mean that you get a diagnosis of depression. And I think that's where the that's where the disconnect is for a lot of people. Oh, you're trying to tell me I'm sad and I'm depressed. No, that's not what I'm trying to mm -hmm. tell you. Because, you know, there's there's a lot of and, and understand with my own clients, I diagnose very conservatively um, for a reason, because I think that culture plays a lot in, in, in terms of the way that we see emotions sometimes mm -hmm. and the way that we, um, feel emotions sometimes. And so I diagnose very conservatively. Um, but at the same time, I think it's important for people to understand that when the symptoms start changing, the diagnosis changes and that just because you feel sad, it doesn't necessarily mean that you are depressed because there are so many different criteria that you have to be given in order to be labeled with that diagnosis. Does that make sense? So what you're saying then words, again, going back to that idea of language, words are important. So if I tell myself I'm really depressed mm -hmm. and I'm aware of that, mm -hmm. uh, it seems like then maybe I should go a step further and say, well, how are you really feeling? Are you just sad? Right. Or what is this going on? Because yeah. if I say that I'm depressed, there's a whole bunch of other stuff that can so, go along so, with that in my mind. So sadness is an emotion. Depression is a diagnosis. There's a certain amount of criteria that has to go with it. Sadness is an emotion. So if you say to yourself, you know, I'm really feeling sad today. And then you, you start thinking about it. Okay, well, I've been sad the last two or three days. And then you start noticing, okay, my appetite is gone or I'm eating too much or my sleep is erratic. Um, my family says that I'm just being really irritable. I'm more isolative. You know, I, it's hard for me to concentrate. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, 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 I'm crying for no reason. Mm -hmm. When you start having all of those things, then we can start talking about a quote unquote diagnosis. But to just feel sad, that does not mean that you are ill. It just means you are sad. Now, why you're sad, you know, what's going on to trigger the sadness. Yeah, we can talk about that. But before we go putting labels on people, let's let's stop and, and take a step back and think of, OK, how are you feeling emotionally right now? OK, can you identify where the where the emotions are coming from? Mm -hmm. You know, once you start being able to be aware of that, that gives you a, so much information with how you interact with other people. One of the things that I realize is that many people don't know what an emotion is. Mm -hmm. You can say happy or mad. They, they know what that is or sad, but to feel excited or to feel encouraged or discouraged or to feel bored or to feel joy, you know, there are so many different kinds of, we are emotional beings, you know? And so the first thing I'll say is, how are you feeling emotionally today? And even when I go to Publix and they, you get to the line, oh, did you find everything you need? Yes, I did. Thank you. Okay, well, how are you doing today? First thing I go to, oh, I'm well, thank you. Well is not an emotion. And so when we are forced to have to sit down and really think about emotions, for some of us, it's like, wow, do I really know what an emotion is? Mm -hmm. You know, if, if, if you can't say happy or sad, you know, you're in your left with, okay, well, I feel peaceful. I feel content. You know, I feel indifferent, but I feel okay. I feel all right. I feel good. Yeah, those are not emotions. Mm -hmm. We would sing the song, if you're, if you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. 
<laughs> we would sing that in church all the time. But how it plays out in real life, I think that's very <laughs> profound. We we're we're not always aware of emotions, yeah. how to uh, express how we're feeling and what all of that means. Right. And if you came from a, a culture like I did, you know, y- you didn't really have a lot of freedom mm-hmm. to express, <laughs> you mm-hmm. know, your emotions. Mm-hmm. Um, and, so, and so I think that, too, is a part of mental health. Again, helping people to know and to understand that there's a certain amount of freedom that you have to live your life. Some of us grew up in very sheltered cultures. Some of us grew up in cultures where we were harmed, where we were traumatized, where there were a lot of things that happened in those cultures. And granted, we may not have had control over how we grew up or how our caretaker took care of us. But as adults who are responsible for ourselves, we have complete control over how we care for ourselves as adults. This has been a very powerful conversation. And um, I think my takeaway today is this idea of, you know, how we talk in the church about getting happy. Sister Sarah got happy Mm -hmm. and Brother John got happy. Uh, This idea of really about being aware and being able to articulate our emotions Mm -hmm. in a very healthy way, a very mindful way and how churches, how communities, how families can support our emotional life, our mental health, Mm -hmm. um, and how it's important for us to understand that we do have control over certain things in our life. And knowing that brings about a large sense of freedom that we may not recognize that we've had before that awareness. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and, and just to add on to that, you know, when you talk about being, whether it is your mental being or your emotional being or your physical being or your spiritual being, you know, that in its totality, you know, there's a there's a sense of joy that you have when you know that you are in control of it. And it doesn't mean that everything is working perfectly, but you know that you have a sense of control over how to get things better for you. You have that internal joy that even when you're not happy, you know it's still there. You have that internal peace that even when things are a little rough, that peace is still there because we're not going to always be happy. We're not supposed to be. We're not supposed to be because we have a plethora of different emotions that we can feel. But being able to know who you are and be empowered enough to understand your control over you can give you the joy and the peace that you need as you are striving to work through some of the, 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 the stressors in your, because the stresses are there, especially in this presidency can i say that you can say that okay especially in this presidency <laughs> okay yes um the stressors are there mm-hmm. and particularly if you are an older lesbian mm-hmm. who has lived through years and years and years of feeling as if you could not be who you were you've already done that just think about what would happen and what the rest of your life might look like If you invested in your mental health, invested in control over you, and just allowed yourself to be who you really are. If people want to contact you to have an extended conversation around the freedom and control they seek in their life, how would they best do that? The best way to do that would probably be to call my office, and that number is 678-278-2002. Um, you can al- also email me at D as in David, R D D Bates at gmail.com. And if you want more information about me, you're welcome to go to my website and that's Dr. D Bates.com. Dr. Dion Bates, thank you for sharing in our black lesbian history today. It has been a pleasure. Thank you so very much, Reverend Angela Denise Davis. Great conversation with Dr. Dion Bates. 
I hope you enjoyed our time together as much as I did. And I hope you made note of some things to carry with you. For me, it was the importance of understanding our emotions, being real about how we feel, and checking our behavior to see how things are matching up. If you're interested in having a conversation with her, be sure to check out our show notes for contact information. I enjoyed this conversation so much, I'm going to be sure to send a link to some friends who may find it just as meaningful. You do the same. And remember the word for the day. Be real about how you feel. Take care. Bye-bye.